Solander's Radio Tomb. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Carter Abel. Solander's Radio Tomb by Ellis Parker Butler. I had first met Mr. Remington Solander shortly after I installed my first radio set. I was going into New York on the 8.15 a.m. train and was sitting with my friend Murchison. As a matter of course, we were talking radio. I had just told Murchison that he was a lunk-headed noodle and that for two cents I would poke him in the jaw and that even a pin-headed idiot ought to know that a tube set was better than a crystal set. To this, Murchison replied, that, he, that that had settled it. He had always known that I was a moron, and now he was sure of it. If you had enough brains to fill a hazelnut shell, he said, you wouldn't talk that way. Anybody but a half-baked lunatic would know what a man wants in radio is clear, sharp reception, and that's what a crystal gives you. You're one of these half-wits who think they're classy if they can hear some two-cent station 500 miles away utter a few faint squeaks. Shut up. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to listen to you. Go and sit somewhere else. Of course, this was what was to be expected of Murchison, and if I did let out a few lapses of anger, I feel I was entirely justified. Radio fans are always disputing the relative merits of crystal and tube sets, but I knew I was right. I was just trying to decide whether to choke Murchison with my bare hand and throw his lifeless body out the car window, or tell him a few things I'd been wanting to say ever since he'd been knocking my tube set, when this Remington Solinger, who was sitting behind us, leaned forward and tapped me on the shoulder. I turned quickly and saw his long, sheep-like face close to mine. He was chewing cardamom seed and breathing the odor into my face. My friend, he said, come back and sit with me. I want to ask you a few questions about radio. Well, I couldn't resist that, could I? No radio fan could. I did not care much for the looks of this Remington Solander man, but for a few weeks my friends had seemed to be steering away from me when I drew near, and although I'm sure I never said anything to bore them. All I ever talked about was my radio set and some new hookups I was trying, but I had noticed that men who had formerly seemed fond of my company now gave startled looks when I neared them. Some even climbed over the nearest fence and ran madly across vacant lots, looking over their shoulders with flight frightened glances as they ran. For a week I had not been able to get a man of my acquaintance to listen to one word for me, except Murchison, and he's an utter idiot, as I think I have made clear. So I left Murchison and sat with Remington Solander. In one way I was proud to be invited to sit with Remington Solander because he was far and away the richest man in our town. When he died, his estate proved to amount to three million dollars. I'd seen him often and knew who he was, but he was a standoffish old fellow and did not mix, so I'd never met him. He was a tall man and thin, somewhat flabby, and he was pale in an unhealthy sort of way. But after all, he was a millionaire and a member of one of the old families of Westcote. So I took the seat alongside of him with considerable satisfaction. I gather, he said, as soon as I was seated, that you are interested in radio. I told him I was. And I'm just building a new radio set, using a new hookup that I've heard of a week ago, I said. I think it's going to be a wonder. Now, here's the idea. Instead of using a grid... Yes, yes, the old aristocrat said hastily. But never you mind that now. I know very little of such things have an electrician employed by the year to care for my radio set, and I leave such things to him. You're not a lawyer, are you not? I told him that I was. And you are chairman of the trustees of the Westcote Cemetery, are you not? he asked. I told him I was that also, and I might say that the Westcote Cemetery Association is one of the rightest and tightest little corporations in existence. It has been in existence since 1808, and has been exceedingly profitable to those fortunate enough to hold its stock. I inherited the small block for, from my grandfather. Recently, we trustees had bought 60 additional acres adjoining the old cemetery and had added them to it, and we were about to ready to put new lots on the market, 
at 300 apiece, they promised to be tremendous profit in the thing, for our cemetery was a fashionable place to be buried, and the demand for lots in the new addition promised to be enormous. You have not known it, said Remington Solander in his slow drawl, which had the effect of letting his words slide out of his mouth and drip down his long chin like cold molasses. But I have been making inquiries about you, and I have been meaning to speak to you. I am drawing up a new last will and testament, and want you to draw up one of its clauses for me, without delay. Why, certainly, Mr. Solander, I said with increased pride. I'll be glad to be of service to you. I am choosing you for the work, Remington Solander said, because you know and love radio as I do and because you are a trustee of the Cemetery Association. Are you a religious man? Well, I said a little uneasily, some, some but not much. No matter, said Mr. Solander, placing a hand on my arm. I am, and have always been. From my very earliest youth, my mind has been on serious things. As a matter of fact, sir, I have compiled a manuscript collection of religious quotations, hymns, sermons, and uplifting thoughts which now fill fourteen volumes, all in my own handwriting. Fortunately, I inherited some money, and this collection is my gift to the world. And a noble one, I'm sure, I said. Most noble, said Mr. Cylinder. But, sir, I haven't confined my activities to the study chair. I have kept my eyes on the progress of the world, and it seems to me that radio, this new and wonderful invention, is the greatest discovery of all ages and imperishable. But, sir, it is being twisted to cheap uses, jazz, cheap songs, worldly words and music. That I mean to remedy. Well, I said, it might be done. Of course, people like what they like. Some nobler souls like better things, said Remington Solander solemnly. Some more worthy men and women will welcome nobler radio broadcasting. In my will, I am putting aside one million dollars to establish and maintain a broadcasting station that will broadcast only my fourteen volumes of hymns and uplifting material. Every day this matter will go forth, sermons, lectures on prohibition, noble thoughts, and religious poems. I assured him that some people might be glad to get that, and that a lot of people might, in fact, and that I could write that into his will without any trouble at all. Ah, said Remington Solander, that is already in my will. What I want you to write for my will is another clause. I mean to build, in your cemetery, a high-class and imperishable granite tune for myself, and I mean to place it on that knoll, that high knoll, the highest spot on your cemetery. What I want you to write into my will is a clause providing for the perpetual care and maintenance of my tomb. I want to set aside five hundred thousand dollars for that purpose. Well, I said to the sheep-faced millionaire, I can do that too. Yes, he agreed, and I want to give to my family and relations the remaining million and a half dollars, provided, he said, accenting the provided. They carry out, faithfully, the provisions of the clause providing for the perpetual care and maintenance of my tomb. If they don't care and maintain, he said, giving me a hard look, that million and a half dollars is to go to the home for flea-bitten dogs. They'll care and maintain all right, I laughed. I think so, Remington Solander said gravely. I do think so indeed. And now, sir, we come to the important part. You, as I know, are the trustee of the cemetery. Yes, I said, I am, for drawing this clause of my will, if you can draw it, said Remington Solander, looking me full in the eye with both of his own, which were like the eyes of a salt mackerel, I shall pay you five thousand dollars. Well, I almost gasped. It was a big lot of money for drawing one clause of a will, and I began to smell a rat right there. But, I may say, the proposition Remington Solander made to me was one I was able to, after quite a talk with my fellow trustees of the cemetery, to, I was able to carry out. What Remington Solander wanted was to be permitted to put a radio loudspeaking outfit in his granite tomb, 
a radio loudspeaking outfit permanently set at 327 meters wavelength, which was to be the wavelength of his endowed broadcasting station. I don't know how Remington Solander got his first remarkable idea, but just about that time an undertaker in New York had rigged up a hearse with a phonograph so that the hearse would loudspeak suitable hymns on the way to the cemetery, and that may have suggested the loudspeaking tomb to Remington Solander. But it's not important where he got the idea. He had it, and he was set on having it carried out. Think, he said, of the uplifting effect of it. On the highest spot in the cemetery will stand my noble tomb, loud speaking in all directions the solemn and holy words and music I have collected in my fourteen volumes. All who enter the cemetery will hear. All will be ennobled and uplifted. That was so, too. I saw that at once. I said so. So Remington Solander went on to explain that the income from the $500,000 would be set aside to keep A batteries and B batteries supplied, to keep the outfit in repair, and so on. So I tackled the job rather enthusiastically. I don't say that the $5,000 fee didn't interest me, but I did think Remington Solander had a grand, grand idea. It would make our cemetery stand out. People would come from everywhere to see and listen. The lots in the new edition would sell like hotcakes. But I did have a little trouble with the other trustees. They balked when I explained that Remington Solander wanted the sole radio loudspeaking rights of our cemetery, but someone finally suggested that if Remington Solander put up a new and artistic iron fence around the whole cemetery, it might be alright. They made him submit his 14 volumes so that they could see what sort of matter he meant to broadcast from his high class station and they agreed that it was solemn enough. It was all solemn and sad and gloomy, just the stuff for a cemetery. So when Remington Solander agreed to build the new iron fence, they made a formal contract with him, and I drew up the clause for the will, and he bought six lots on the top of the high knoll and began erecting his marble mausoleum. For eight months or so, Remington Solander was busier than he had ever been in his life. He superintended the building of the tomb, and he had on hand the job of getting his endowed radio station going. It was given the letters WZZZ, and hiring artists to sing and play, and speechify his 14 volumes of gloom and uplift at 327 meters, and it was too much for the old codger. The very night of the test of the WZZZ outfit was made, he passed away and was no more on earth. His funeral was one of the biggest we've ever had on West Coast. I should judge that 5,000 people attended his remains to the cemetery, for it had become widely known that the first WZZZ program would be received and loud spoken from Remington Solander's tomb that afternoon. The first selection of the program, his favorite hymn, beginning as the funeral cortege left the church and the program continuing until dark. I'll say it was one of the most affecting occasions I'd ever witnessed. As the body was being carried into the tomb, the loudspeaker gave us a sermon by Reverend Peter L. Ruggis, full of sob stuff. Every one of the 5,000 present wept. And when the funeral was really finished, over 2,000 remained to hear the rest of the program, which consisted of hymns, missionary reports, static and recitations of religious poems. We increased the price of the lots in the new edition $100 per lot immediately, and we sold four lots that afternoon and two the next morning. The big metropolitan newspapers all gave the West Coast Cemetery full-page illustrated articles the next Sunday, and we received, during the next week, over 300 letters, mostly from ministers praising what we had done. But that was not the best of it. Requests for lots had come in by mail. Not only people in West Coast wrote for prices, but people over in New Jersey, and up in Westchester County, and even as far as Poughkeepsie and Delaware. We had twice as many requests for lots as there were lots to sell, and we decided that we would have an auction and let them go to the highest bidders. You see, Remington Solander's talking tomb was becoming nationally famous. We began to negotiate with the owners of six farms adjacent to our cemetery. We figured on buying them and making more new additions to the cemetery, and then we found out we couldn't use three of the farms. The reason was that the loudspeaker in Remington Solander's tomb would not carry that far. It was not strong enough. So we went to the executors of his estate and ran up against another snag. 
Nothing in the radio outfit in the tomb could be altered in any way whatever. That was in the will. The same loudspeaker had to be maintained, and the same wavelength had to be kept, and the same makes of batteries had to be used, the same style of tubes had to be used. Remington Solander had thought of it all. So we decided to let well enough alone. It was all we could do anyway. We bought the farms that were reached by the loudspeaker and had them surveyed and laid out in lots. And then the thing happened. Yes, sir. I'll sell my cemetery stock for two cents on the dollar, if anybody will bid that much for it. For what do you think happened? Along came the government of the United States, regulating this radio thing and assigning new wavelengths to all broadcasting stations. It gave Remington Solander's endowed broadcasting station WZZZ an 855 meter wavelength, and it gave that station at Dodwood, station PKX, the 327 meter wavelength, and the next day, poor old Remington Solander's tomb poured forth, yes we ain't got no bananas, and the hot dog jazz, and if you can't see mama every night, you can't see mama at all, and Hink Tubbs and all his funny stories like, well one day an Irishman and a Swede were walking down Broadway, and they see a flapper coming towards them, and she had on one of them short skirts they was wearing, see? So Mike, he says, GB jabbers, Oli, I see a peach. So the Swede, he says, looking at the silk stockings, maybe ye buy and see a peach, Mike, but I see one mighty nice pair. But the other day I went to see my mother-in-law. You know the sort of program. I don't say that the people who like them are not entitled to them, but I do say that they are not the sort of programs to speak from a loudspeaker from the tomb of a cemetery. I expect old Romington Solander turned clear over in his tomb when those programs began to come through. I know our board of trustees went right up in the air, but there was not a thing we could do about it. The newspapers gave us double pages the next Sunday. Remington Solander's Jazz Tomb and West Coates Two-Step Cemetery, and within a week the inmates of our cemetery began to move out. Friends of people who had been buried over a hundred years came and moved them to other cemeteries and took the headstones and monuments with them. And in a month, our cemetery looked like one of those Great War battlefields, like a lot of shell holes. Not a man, woman, or child was left in the place, except Remington Solander in his granite tomb on top of the high knoll. What we've got on our hands is a deserted cemetery. They all blame me, but I can't do anything about it. All I can do is groan. Every morning I grab the paper and look for the PKX program, and then I groan. Remington Solander is the lucky man. He's dead. End of Solander's Radio Tomb by Ellis Parker Butler Read by Carter Abel